There's a new royal buzzword that's taken social media by storm recently. King Charles's sausage fingers. No, it's not about some delicious sausage roll named after the newly crowned King Charles III, but rather an endearing term to describe his slightly rounded fingers. And trust me, this topic isn't just sizzling, it's roasting. Let's go back a bit to the year 2012, when the then Prince Charles humorously referred to his own sausage fingers. Fast forward to today and King Charles's hands have drawn more eyes than ever. The reason behind the attention? Well, it's not a culinary trend, but rather an unusual physical trait. King Charles's fingers, which have a somewhat puffy, sausage-like appearance. Even though the phrase sausage fingers isn't exactly medical terminology, in this context it does point to a more official term, dactylitis. Fancy sounding, right? It's a blend of the Greek words dactylos, meaning finger, and itis, representing inflammation. In simple terms, dactylitis describes a condition where fingers can swell up to resemble, uh, you guessed it, sausages. Now that we've given you a taste of the medical side of things, let's talk about the coronation of Charles III. After the passing of his beloved mother, Queen Elizabeth II, Charles formally took his place as the monarch of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth realms. And just as you'd expect, this significant event brought together dignitaries from across the globe, all eager to witness the solemn rituals and Charles's crowning moment. And amidst all the royal pomp and ceremony, the world couldn't help but notice King Charles III's distinctively swollen fingers. But before we jump to conclusions, let's hear from a professional. Dr. Chun Tang, medical director at Paul Mall Medical in Manchester, explained that these sausage fingers could be a symptom of water retention or dactylitis, brought on by various factors, ranging from arthritis and bacterial infections to allergic reactions and high salt levels. As intriguing as the subject of the king's sausage fingers might be, it's essential to remember that without a direct medical examination, we can't put our finger on the exact cause. But hey, who are we kidding? It's not like the royal family is fretting about insurance coverage. In the meantime, the world seems to be having a real banger of a time with King Charles's fingers, turning social media into a delightful sausage fest. Remember, folks, amidst the speculation and humor, our primary intention is to inform, not to poke fun. As we say farewell for now, remember a king's hand may be worth observing, but it's his actions that truly matter. Stay tuned for more exciting topics. Stick around, Story Reels fans. Our next story is coming up right now. When Meghan Markle and Prince Harry's love story began, the world couldn't help but take notice. As their royal wedding drew near, Meghan's family members found themselves in the limelight too. The Markle family drama unfolded like a riveting reality show for everyone to see. Now, while Prince Harry's better half remains estranged from her father and half-siblings, they aren't the only ones feeling ghosted by her. So who else claims Meghan left them in the dust after meeting her prince? Let's dive in and find out. Picture this. Gina Nelthorpe Cowan, Meghan's trusty agent and close pal, before Prince Charming entered the scene. She was not only handling Meghan's professional affairs, but also among the first to get the inside scoop on her royal romance with Harry. But when Gina attempted to gently warn Meghan about the whirlwind of change heading her way, the future Duchess decided it was time to part ways. Gina shared with the Daily Mail, We were lunching on the Strand in London, and I could see things were heating up with Harry. I cautioned her about the drastic shift in privacy and her regular life, but she chose to shrug off my concerns, focusing on the joy ahead instead. Meghan bid adieu to her working relationship with Gina just a week before announcing her engagement to Prince Harry, and the two haven't been in touch since. Next up, talk show host Piers Morgan, who claims to be another ghosting victim of the Duchess of Sussex. Here's the backstory. In 2016, Morgan followed Meghan on Twitter, and she promptly sent him a thank you message. Soon, they started chatting frequently, and when Meghan visited London, they decided to meet in person. Picture them at Morgan's favorite pub, engaged in hours of lively conversation over beers and dirty martinis. As the night came to an end, Meghan expressed her delight, saying she'd love to catch up again before hopping into a cab. But once Meghan started dating Harry, Piers never heard from her again. He shared with The Late Late Show's host Ryan Tuberty that 
Megan ghosted him, admitting his distaste for such behavior, calling it kind of rude. Enter Lizzie Cundy, a British TV personality and commentator who befriended Meghan three years before Prince Harry entered the picture. The two first connected at a charity event, sitting side by side. Even though Lizzie had never seen Suits and didn't know who Meghan was, they struck up a great conversation. Meghan expressed her interest in dating an Englishman. Both women had experienced breakups and bonded over their shared past. Lizzie recalled Meghan's desire for kids and her openness to an English partner. When news broke that Meghan was dating Prince Harry, Lizzie excitedly texted her, exclaiming, What a catch! Meghan agreed, replying, Yeah, I know. But as Meghan and Harry's relationship grew serious, Lizzie noticed a shift. Once the engagement was announced, their friendship faded. Lizzie revealed that Meghan ghosted her, with their communication channels vanishing as quickly as Meghan's Twitter presence. And just like that, their connection was lost. TV presenter Nick Eade, another former friend of Meghan's, echoed Lizzie Cundy's sentiments, saying Meghan had her sights set on an English guy. Meghan was a blast to be around, Nick shared, and it was clear that she was looking for an Englishman to be her partner. The two became friends in 2013 when Nick was working with Eva Longoria on charity projects. He invited Meghan to host the Global Gift Gala, a major charity event, and they developed a strong, fun-filled friendship over the years. But just like the others, Nick's friendship with Meghan came to a sudden halt once she and Harry started dating. It seemed as if Meghan's connections with her former pals were left behind in her new royal life. As we've seen, Meghan Markle's life took a dramatic turn when she met Prince Harry. And with it, some of her closest friendships seem to have vanished into thin air. From agents to TV personalities, it appears that Meghan's past connections were left behind as she embarked on her new royal journey. While some might argue that it's a necessary step when entering the world of royalty, it's still fascinating to see how people who once played significant roles in Meghan's life were seemingly ghosted. The question remains, is this just part of the royal package or a reflection of something deeper within the Duchess? Whatever the answer may be, one thing's for sure. Meghan Markle's story continues to captivate and intrigue us all. Stick around, Story Reels fans. Our next story is coming up right now. Get ready to gasp in disbelief as we reveal the jaw-dropping truth about Rachel McAdams' mid-aughts career choices. While Nicholas Holt's recent lost roles in the Batman Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 and Top Gun Maverick made headlines, it's nothing compared to the A-list projects McAdams turned down one after another. In a recent Bustle profile, it was revealed that during her two-year hiatus in Canada after hitting it big with Mean Girls in the Notebook, McAdams turned down offers for not one, not two, but five major blockbuster movies. Can you believe she said no to The Devil Wears Prada, Casino Royale, Mission Impossible 3, Iron Man, and Get Smart? Rachel McAdams has shared some wise words about the importance of following your instincts, even when it means turning down incredible opportunities. When her career was skyrocketing, McAdams made the tough decision to say no to multiple film projects despite feeling guilty about potentially missing out. She said in an interview, There were definitely some anxious moments of wondering if I was just throwing it all away. And why was I doing that? It's taken years to understand what I intuitively was doing. Find out why McAdams made these shocking career decisions and what she thinks about them now in this captivating expose. Rachel McAdams shocked fans when it was revealed she turned down the role in the iconic movie The Devil Wears Prada. According to director David Frankel, McAdams was actually their top choice for the role of Andy Sachs, even before they started negotiations with Anne Hathaway. The studio was so determined to cast McAdams that they reportedly offered her the role not once, not twice, but three times. However, despite their persistence, McAdams was resolute in her decision to turn down the role. The casting process for The Devil Wears Prada was a roller coaster ride. With big names like Natalie Portman, Kate Hudson, Kirsten Dunst, and Scarlett Johansson all considered for the part. But it was Anne Hathaway who ultimately snagged the role. After campaigning hard to convince the studio, she was the perfect fit. And boy, did Hathaway deliver. Despite reportedly being the ninth choice, her performance as Andy Sachs was nothing short of amazing. Who are you? Uh, my name is Andy Sachs. I recently graduated from Northwestern University. And what are you doing here? <clears throat> well, 
I think I could do a good job as your assistant. Hold on to your martini glasses, folks, because we're about to reveal the second blockbuster movie that Rachel McAdams turned down. Casino Royale! Can you imagine McAdams as a Bond girl? Well, it's a bummer that we missed out on that. We got the amazing Eva Green instead. And let's be real, Green killed it as Vesper Lind in the film. From her stunning looks to her raw talent, Green brought the character to life in a way that left us all shaken, not stirred. Who could forget that iconic scene where she first meets Bond on the train, or when she confesses her love for him in the shower? Green's performance was nothing short of unforgettable, and we couldn't be happier that she was cast in the role. So, while we can only imagine what a Rachel McAdams Bond girl would have looked like, we can't deny that Green was the perfect choice for the part. In what could have been a major career move for the actress, McAdams opted out of the action-packed Mission Impossible franchise. But as she stated in an interview with Bustle, the project simply wasn't quite jiving with my personality and what she needed to stay sane. But while McAdams may have passed on the opportunity to work with Tom Cruise and company, another actress was ready and willing to take her place. Scarlett Johansson. Initially cast in Mission Impossible 3, when Joe Carnahan was at the helm, Johansson was already busy training for stunts with Cruise when J.J. Abrams took over as director and changes were made to the cast. Rumors swirled about why Johansson ultimately didn't end up in the film, with some speculating that she was fired or left due to script changes and delays. And then there's the rumor that Johansson refused Cruise's invitation to join his Scientology church, leading to her departure from the project. In the end, the role of a leading lady went to Michelle Monaghan, who proved to be the perfect love interest for Cruz's character, Ethan Hunt. Monaghan's chemistry with Cruz was off the charts, and her charm shone through in every scene. While we may never know what could have been with McAdams or Johansson, we can't deny that Monaghan's performance was the perfect fit for the franchise. Did you know that the Hollywood darling once turned down the chance to star in Iron Man? That's right, McAdams revealed to Bustle that she was offered the role of Pepper Potts but ultimately turned it down to focus on her personal life and family. While we can't imagine anyone else playing the role besides Gwyneth Paltrow, it's intriguing to think about what McAdams' portrayal of the beloved character would have been like. But don't worry. McAdams eventually made her way to the Marvel Cinematic Universe as Christine Palmer in Doctor Strange and the upcoming Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. And let's be real, McAdams' incredible talent and undeniable charm make her a welcome addition to any blockbuster franchise, even if it was a little later than we all would have liked. In three, two, one. Oh, what could have been? Rachel McAdams was reportedly in talks to star alongside Steve Carell in the reboot of the classic spy comedy Get Smart. The talented actress could have stepped into Anne Hathaway's shoes as Agent 99, Carell's witty and capable partner in espionage. While we can only imagine how awesome it would have been to see McAdams and Carell team up, Hathaway definitely held her own in the role, delivering an unforgettable performance. Despite missing out on the opportunity to star in Get Smart, McAdams' impressive resume speaks for itself. Mm. Max? Mm. Max, stay calm. Mm. Max, keep it together. Oh, shit. Max, Max. <laughs> Even though it must have been hard to resist the allure of all that fame and fortune, McAdams knew deep down that those films just weren't a good fit for her. And with classics like Mean Girls and The Notebook under her belt, who can blame her for sticking to her guns? Despite the success of those missed opportunities, McAdams has no regrets and recognizes that the right actors were ultimately cast in those roles. It's all good, and she's got plenty of exciting projects on the horizon, like her upcoming film, Are You There, God? It's me, Margaret, hitting theater soon.
Did you know that Russell Crowe almost walked away from one of his most iconic roles in Gladiator due to a bizarre original script? Today, we're diving into this fascinating story and the journey from a peculiar concept to a blockbuster film. So grab your popcorn and let's get started. Today, we're chatting about how Russell Crowe almost said adios to Ridley Scott's 2000 historical epic Gladiator. This Oscar-winning movie, which raked in a whopping $503 million worldwide, had a rather strange start, according to Crowe's recent interview with Vanity Fair. Despite his confidence as a leading man, Crowe felt uneasy about the world surrounding him in Gladiator. The original script was, in his words, absolute rubbish, featuring peculiar sequences like gladiators promoting olive oil on their chariots. Although based on real historical endorsements, Crowe knew that modern audiences would be left scratching their heads. But thanks to ongoing conversations with Ridley Scott, Crowe stayed on board. Scott promised that nothing would be filmed without Crowe's 100% belief in it. By the time they started filming, they only had 21 pages of an agreed-upon script, which typically spans around 100 to 110 pages. So they had quite the journey ahead, making up the story as they went along. Fast forward to today, and Gladiator is considered a classic. Ridley Scott is now preparing to direct the long-awaited sequel with Paul Mescal taking over the franchise, playing Lucius, the son of Lucilla. So there you have it, folks. The incredible story of how Gladiator went from a potential disaster to a box office sensation. Who knew that chariots with olive oil ads would have been a deal breaker? If you enjoyed this behind-the-scenes tale, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more movie magic. And remember, sometimes a leap of faith can lead to greatness. Are you ready to say goodbye to one of the greatest adventure movie franchises of all time? That's right, folks. After four decades of epic adventures, Indiana Jones is hanging up his fedora and cracking his whip one last time in Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, the fifth and final film in the franchise. Our journey began in 1981 with the phenomenal Raiders of the Lost Ark. And since then, we've witnessed Ford's audacious exploits as the dauntless archaeologist in the 1984 prequel, The Temple of Doom, and the 1989 sequel, The Last Crusade. After a long intermission, Ford bounced back in 2008 with The Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and now he's all set to embark on the crowning adventure in this fifth and final installment. With excitement for Indiana Jones 5 skyrocketing, Disney has swooped in to clear the air, confirming that this film will indeed mark the end of the epic franchise. Their latest press release hails the Dial of Destiny as the long-awaited final act in this treasured saga. James Mangold, who takes the reins from Spielberg, describes the movie as the pinnacle of Indiana Jones adventures. Although Harrison Ford has hinted in the past that he'll be hanging up his fedora, it's the first time Disney has set the record straight, solidifying the Dial of Destiny as the grand finale fans have been waiting for. So, why is the Indiana Jones franchise wrapping up, you ask? Well, it boils down to our beloved Harrison Ford, who at the spry age of 80 isn't quite as eager to dive into action-packed stunts anymore. To top it off, while shooting Dial of Destiny, Ford even suffered a shoulder injury during a fight rehearsal, prompting a few behind-the-scenes tweaks for his recovery. By bringing the curtain down with Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, fans hope the adored franchise can make a stylish exit, steering clear of any potential missteps with less-than-stellar spin-offs featuring side characters. There's been some buzz about an Indiana Jones TV show brewing over at Disney+, Plus, with Mangold mentioning that it wouldn't center on Ford's daring archaeologist. But plot twist. Word on the street is that the series might be hitting the chopping block especially now that Disney's declared Dial of Destiny the grand finale of the franchise. This unexpected revelation is sure to crank up the hype meter as fans everywhere gear up for an unforgettable summer with Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny hitting theaters, as we brace ourselves for the exhilarating climax of the Indiana Jones saga. It's the perfect time to venture into the realm of fan theories and predictions for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. From riveting plot speculations to nods to past films, and even some surprising character evolutions, there's no shortage of thrilling ideas about what lies in store for our favorite fedora-clad hero. So what do you think? 
Will there be unexpected twists or familiar faces making a comeback? Share your thoughts, theories, and predictions in the comments below. And let's embark on this final adventure together as we uncover the secrets of the Dial of Destiny. The spellbinding allure of a movie frequently hinges on the chemistry between its characters, and Grease perfectly embodies this. The legendary pairing of John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John infused the film with their irresistible magnetism. Intriguingly, their on-screen romance reflected a simmering tension beneath the surface, leading, as Newton-John disclosed, to an authentic mutual attraction. Heartbreakingly, the world lost Olivia Newton-John on August 8, 2022, when she was 73. Back when Grease was filmed, she was only 28 and nearly skipped out on the role. Imagine, it could have been Carrie Fisher or Marie Osmond, but fate had other plans. Newton-John stepped up and she and Travolta even locked lips in a surprise, unscripted moment, though the scene never made it to the final cut. With chemistry so effortless and electric, it's no wonder audiences speculated about the true nature of Travolta and Newton-John's relationship. Both stars openly acknowledged their connection. In her autobiography, Don't Stop Believin', Newton-John admitted, Yes, we really liked each other and there was an attraction. Travolta also confirmed their mutual feelings. When asked point-blank about the sexual tension between them, he candidly replied, I think you saw that in You're the One That I Want. There's almost a resolution of that tension right there. From the get-go, Travolta and Newton-John formed a deep connection, and Travolta actually played a crucial role in Newton-John's casting. Initially, the execs considered other actresses for Sandy, while Newton-John hesitated due to past projects that left her feeling disheartened. Travolta, however, was adamant. There's only one person that should play this role, and it's Olivia Newton-John. She's every guy's dream. And just like that, their meaningful bond took root. The day Travolta personally convinced Newton-John was truly unforgettable, she reminisced. I went outside to be greeted by those piercing blue eyes and the warmest smile on the planet, she recalled. In person, John Travolta radiates pure joy and love. That day, he greeted me with a big hug like we were already lifelong friends. How could you say no to John Travolta? At one point, Grease featured an unscripted finale where the stars sealed their romance with a spontaneous kiss. Although it didn't make it into the final movie, their lips still met at the premiere's after-party, sparking whispers about their off-screen chemistry. As it turned out, those rumors were repeatedly confirmed by both Travolta and Newton-John themselves. And there you have it, a behind-the-scenes glimpse into the magnetic connection between these two legendary stars. The next time you watch Grease, remember the captivating love story that unfolded, both on and off the screen. It's a testament to the power of true chemistry and a reminder that sometimes life imitates art in the most enchanting ways. They've touched our hearts, they've made us smile, and became dear friends, who we will always remain hopelessly devoted to. Imagine being offered a role in the sequel of the highest-grossing movie ever and saying, no thanks. Well, that's precisely what Michelle Rodriguez did. In the 2009 sci-fi sensation Avatar, Michelle Rodriguez first graced the screen as Trudy Chacon. As a combat pilot working for the Avatar program, Trudy's heart was with the Navi people. So much so that she gave her life in a heroic battle ensuring the Navi could triumph against the not-so-nice humans attempting to seize control of Pandora. Last year's release, Avatar The Way of the Water, marked the franchise's much-anticipated sequel. Interestingly, it featured the return of Miles Quaritch, played by Stephen Lang, despite his character's untimely demise in the first film. When Michelle Rodriguez caught up with Jim Cameron, he entertained the idea of her making a comeback too. But Michelle put her foot down, reminding him that her character had died a martyr's death. And bringing her back just wouldn't make sense. This fast and furious superstar had a heart-to-heart -heart with Vanity Fair, explaining why she told James Cameron that reviving her Avatar character would be 
in her words, overkill. Avatar, are we going to see you in the third one? Oh, I wish, man. My, my death was a martyr's death. You see, Michelle's been brought back from the dead three times already in her career, so one more might just be pushing it. Michelle didn't hesitate to remind Cameron of her many cinematic resurrections. She pointed out, I came back in Resident Evil, I wasn't supposed to. I came back in Machete, I wasn't supposed to. I came back with Letty, I wasn't supposed to. We can't do a fourth time. That would be overkill. Rodriguez even expressed her confusion over this odd trend of her dead characters returning to life, joking that perhaps they just can't figure out what to do with a girl who doesn't have a boyfriend, so they keep killing her off and then reviving her. Saying no to an Avatar sequel is no small matter. We're talking about one of the most monumental movie franchises in history. The original Avatar still holds the crown as the highest grossing movie ever, raking in a jaw dropping $2.9 billion globally. Fast forward 13 years, and Avatar The Way of Water shook the box office with a whopping $2.3 billion, making it the third highest grossing film in history. In its first two weeks alone, it bagged $1 billion, surpassing even Cameron's own 1997 masterpiece, Titanic. Critics loved it too, with NME giving it a glowing four-star review, calling it a groundbreaking, visually stunning film. The Avatar universe is far from done expanding. Back in 2016, it was revealed that four sequels were in the pipeline, which would include Avatar The Way of Water, Avatar The Seed Bearer, Avatar The Tulkun Rider, and Avatar The Quest for Iwa. As for Michelle Rodriguez, she's got a busy first half of 2023 with the release of Dungeons & Dragons Honor Among Thieves, which is already out, and the upcoming Fast 10 set to hit screens in May, courtesy of Universal Pictures. So what's the deal with Michelle Rodriguez's characters meeting their maker so often on screen? It's something that hasn't gone unnoticed by fans, sparking lively online debates about her tendency for on-screen demises, from Lost to Avatar and Resident Evil. Michelle weighed in on the topic during a 2023 Wired autocomplete interview, saying, They always kill me. They're like, she doesn't have a boyfriend? We don't know what the purpose of this strong female is. Chris Pine chimed in, pointing out that fans love her enough to bring her back to life, to which Rodriguez agreed, but questioned, why kill me in the first place? Despite her character's short lifespans, Rodriguez appreciates the roles she's taken on. She admitted to Hollywood News, I was typecast the minute I did a film called Girl Fight years ago. You allow yourself to be typecast. If she ever wanted to break the mold, she'd choose an indie film where she'd play a character going through a harrowing experience, potentially earning herself an award for portraying vulnerability or mental illness. Despite this intriguing pattern in Rodriguez's career, where her characters are repeatedly killed off and brought back to life, there's no denying that Michelle Rodriguez has carved out a unique niche for herself in the film industry, consistently captivating audiences with her strong, memorable characters. Looks like we have to get ready to say goodbye to one of the all-time greats in Hollywood. After over six decades of captivating audiences with his talent, Clint Eastwood may be getting ready to hang up his directorial hat for good. With a filmography of almost 50 movies under his belt, it's hard to imagine the world of film without him. But according to Discussing Film, Eastwood has already begun working on his final directorial project, signaling that the end of his legendary career may be drawing near. Are you ready to see how this iconic filmmaker will end his incredible run in the movie industry? Clint Eastwood's final directorial project is reportedly set to be distributed by none other than Warner Brothers. This isn't surprising, as Eastwood has been in cahoots with the legendary studio for almost 50 years, directing 10 films for them since his 2008 masterpiece, Gran Torino. You might remember some of his other Warner Brothers hits, like American Sniper, Sully, and Richard Jewell, all of which left audiences on the edge of their seats. And let's not forget about his latest film, Cry Macho, which was also distributed by Warner Brothers and HBO Max. It's clear that Eastwood and Warner Brothers have a long and fruitful history together, and we can't wait to see what magic they'll create with his final project. Looks like there's been a bit of a shakeup in the upper echelons of Hollywood, as some insiders are pointing to a possible change in attitude at Warner Brothers. Apparently, the studio's new CEO, David Zaslav, 
wasn't initially sold on the idea of continuing the partnership with Clint Eastwood after last year's acquisition of Warner Media by Discovery. Rumors even suggest that Zaslav wasn't keen on greenlighting Eastwood's most recent film, Cry Macho, and allegedly stated that the decision was made purely because of Eastwood's involvement. We don't owe anyone any favors, he reportedly said. But now, with reports emerging that Eastwood's final directorial project will also be distributed by Warner Brothers, it seems like the CEO may have changed his tune. It'll be interesting to see how this relationship develops, and whether this marks a new era for the studio under Zaslav's leadership. According to reports, Clint Eastwood's final directorial project is tentatively titled Juror No. 2 and centers around a juror who begins to suspect that he may actually be the murderer in a high-profile trial. Talk about a twist! As the story unfolds, we'll see the juror grapple with the moral dilemma of either coming clean and turning himself in, or resorting to manipulative tactics to sway the rest of the jury in his favor. This promises to be an intense and gripping tale that will keep audiences on the edge of their seats until the very end. Can't wait to see what Eastwood has in store for us with this one! It also looks like Clint Eastwood is keeping us guessing when it comes to his retirement plans. While reports are swirling about his upcoming thriller, the legendary filmmaker himself hasn't made any public statements about stepping down from the director's chair. That said, at 93 years old, with over 50 years of directing under his belt and four Academy Awards to his name, it's certainly understandable that he may be considering retirement soon. But let's focus on the exciting news at hand. Eastwood has expressed interest in writing and directing Juror No. 2, which promises to be a captivating and suspenseful film. And we've even heard whispers that he might be looking to cast a young Hollywood star in the lead role, adding a fresh perspective to his signature filmmaking style. Whether or not this marks the end of an era for Eastwood, one thing is for sure. We can't wait to see what he has in store for us with Juror No. 2. Did you know that Clint Eastwood's upcoming thriller, Juror No. 2, is set to be his 40th film as a director? This milestone adds yet another impressive accomplishment to his already illustrious career as both a director and actor. But it's not just the sheer quantity of his work that's impressive. Eastwood is known for his unique and efficient approach to filmmaking, often using a one-take method and delivering films within budget. This sets him apart from his peers in Tinseltown and has earned him numerous accolades, including multiple Academy Award nominations and wins for Best Director and Best Picture for his unforgettable films Unforgiven and Million Dollar Baby. And let's not forget about the other cinematic gems he's directed, such as the gripping drama Mystic River, the powerful war film Letters from Iwo Jima, and the haunting 2008 drama Changeling which starred none other than Angelina Jolie. With a career as storied and impressive as Eastwood's, it's no wonder that Juror No. 2 is one of the most highly anticipated films of the year. This is Story Reels. Subscribe to our channel for the very best in entertainment.